Amen. You can sit down, children, Bob's class. You do what you do. Go where you go. I'm not sure. Uh, this is no offense to Bob, but I have spent many a minute in Bob's class. And uh, it's one of the few places where time stands still. I did go on a kindergarten field trip this week. And uh, I knew this before I went, but I, it was reassured to me that teaching kindergarten wasn't, isn't part of my calling. Um, I'm not sure how much a kindergarten teacher makes, but I reassure you it's not enough. Um, not only keeping up with them and having some form of organization, but my daughter comes home and can read, she can write, she can do math on top of all that. And... Uh, I was a little stressed out before we even got on the bus, and I was just standing there. I didn't have anything to do with the, uh, the, the whole deal. And Dave mentioned that DL and a group of people um, is over in Uganda, which is a little south of Tecumseh. And um, I know that one thing, if you guys remember when you used to have to watch TV and you had to watch the commercials, do you remember that, like before you had a TiVo? And you could, and you could, like, I don't even like to watch a football game, John Martin, until an hour after it started so I can fast forward all the commercials. I don't, and, uh, but, like, if my girls have to watch something with the commercials, you know, it's Oregon Trail stuff. They're just, you know, they're on a meager ration and everything's rough, you know. But uh, remember how always something pivotal would happen in a TV show and then they'd go to the commercial break? You know, stay tuned. Stay tuned for what, when DL gets home. Um, not only the wake that, that, that he left over there and that the Lord in him is going to make, and there's going to be stories for years to come, but listen, when you send a deeply redneck hillbilly abroad, <laughs> there will be stories. Um, I'm not sure what they're going to be. I'm just excited to hear, and uh, they will be memorable things that's happening over there. Um, I'm going to read you a little story here to start with. Um, we're going to talk today about abundant life, and... There's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of preachers today preaching abundant life, and what they're preaching is a prosperity gospel. Do this, and you get this. Do this, and you get that. And uh, we're, listen, we're going to talk about some of that today, um, but there are steps to living an abundant life, and a lot of the steps are necessary for you to take. Um, read you this story. It said, a little boy who lived far out in the country in the late 1800s had reached the age of 12 and had never in all his life, all of his 12 years, seen a circus. He could come to my house in the morning. They're free. Um, you can imagine his excitement when one day a poster went up at school announcing that one, uh, that one was coming to the next town on the following Saturday. <laughs> he ran home with, gl with glad news and the question, Daddy, can I go? Although the family was poor, the father sensed how important it was to this lad. And he said, if you do your chores ahead of time, I'll see that you have the money to go. Come Saturday morning, the chores were done, and the little boy stood by the breakfast table dressed in his Sunday best. His father reached into the pocket of his overalls, pulled out a dollar bill, the most money the little boy had possessed at one time in his entire life. The father cautioned him to be careful and then sent him on his way. The boy was excited. His feet hardly seemed to touch the ground all the way. As he neared the outskirts of the village, he noticed people lining the streets and worked his way through the crowd until he could see what was happening. Lo and behold, it was the approaching spectacle of a circus parade. The parade was the grandest thing the lad had ever seen. Caged animals snared, snarled, snared. Caged animals did something um, as they passed. Bands beat their rhythms and sounded their shiny horns. Midgets performed acrobats while flags and ribbons twirled overhead. Finally, after everything had passed, where he was standing, the traditional circus clown with floppy shoes, baggy pants, and brightly painted face brought up the rear. As the clown passed by, the little boy reached into his pocket, took out his precious dollar. Handing the money to the clown, the boy turned around and went home. What happened? The boy thought he'd seen the circus, but he'd only seen the parade. 
Church, God's calling you to go to the whole thing. He's not just calling you to go to the, 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 the parade that starts the circus. He start, he's, he's calling you to go to the whole thing. And just like the boy in the story, he had everything he needed to go. He just didn't realize it. Ignorance doesn't mean you're stupid, church. It just means you, does, you, you don't know yet. You don't know. God's calling you to an abundant life. And I'm not just talking about stuff. What happens when, if you acquire a few things, you have to take care of them? And that takes time, and it takes effort, and it takes what? Money. Take care of that stuff. Ephesians 2.10 says this, we are God's workmanship. You are God's workmanship. A craftsman. You ever known a, crafts, a craftsman? They take pride in the work and the thing they're building, Right? A carpenter who's a good carpenter wants his stuff to be square and dry, right? A guy that's good at laying concrete wants it to look like a slab of glass when he's done. Lee, you wanted your tires to hold air when you mounted them, didn't you? Listen, as a craftsman, see, you're God's workmanship. He's proud of you. <laughs> Created in Christ Jesus to do the good work that he's prepared in advance for you to do. God has gone before you and prepared a work for you to do. He's gone before you. And he's made a way. The word says he's made a way where there seems to be no way. It says he made the crooked, he's made the, the crooked road straight and the hilly ways flat. God's gone before you and made a way. And listen, faith doesn't come by the things you can see. Faith comes from the things you hear. Faith comes from hearing, church. So you're God's workmanship. You're his craftsmanship. He's proud of you. Listen, and thank the Lord for this. He only made one of you. You know, I had this preconceived notion uh, when my second child was born that she would be a splitting image of my oldest child. Now, you all laugh at that, but I didn't know any better. I only had one frame of reference, and they're not. They have similarities, but they're two different people. Completely. You know why? Because they're fearfully and wonderfully made. They're different. They're different. There's a lot of things in life that are different, but there's a lot of truths that are the same. You're God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do the good work that he's prepared in advance for you to do the good work. Now listen, I didn't say easy work. Easy work. I didn't say, he said the good work, not the good play. Seems like society today is allergic to hard work, right? We, we have conversations with my daughters all the time. There are things in life you have to roll up your sleeves and just do. Do. I remember Dr. Hamby talking about his dad when he was way up in his 80s, sleeping in his Toyota pickup at night to fight the coons away from his sweet corn. Now, Fred Hamby didn't have to be doing that. He chose to be doing that. And Doc went out there one day, and his back, oh, Fred's back was killing him. He said, Dad, why is your back so stiff? And he said, why are you sleeping in the, he said, well, son, I've been sleeping in my truck fighting coons off at night. And Doc was like, why are you doing that? And he said, because I can. Because, see, there's some things in life you just got to roll up your sleeves and do. And listen, you need to be setting the example for the ones behind you. How can I get after my girls when their room is filth, excuse me, filthy, which is all the time, when the garage where I park our rigs looks like a bomb went off. What example am I setting? See, we're God's, work, we're, we're, God's, we're God's craftsmanship. You've been crafted by God to do the work that he's called you to do. Work. A new concept. Work. Jeremiah 29, 11. I'm going to paraphrase this. And I'm going to read you some scriptures. And I, uh, I had a Jesus moment last night. I installed a new printer. And it works. See, look, I printed this off. Um, that took some faith. And uh, I wanted to throw it against the wall several times, but I got it. Um, I'm going to quote you some scripture and then some I've typed down. So if you want to write something down, that's up to you. You guys know me. I'm not going to stay in one spot very long. So moving on with that. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this. this is what God says about you. He says, he has plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but give you a hope and a future. And it goes on to say, you'll find, basically, now I'm paraphrasing. You read it for yourself. You'll find those plans when you seek him with all of your heart. When you seek him. When you look for him, you'll find those prospering plans. I didn't say easy plans. I said prospering plans. 
prospering plans. Third John 1 says this, Beloved, I pray that you prosper in all things. He wants you to prosper in your relationship with your spouse, with your kids, with your grandkids, with your friends, with your siblings, with the people you work with, even those people, the people you work with, the ones you didn't choose. He wants you to prosper with them. He wants you to prosper financially. He doesn't want you to be broke and downtrodden and at at your wit's end. I pray that above all things, you prosper in all things. It goes on to say, in, in, even in your health. Listen, if you divided your life into thirds, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out what third you're in, okay? Even I could do that. I could get my five-year-old up here and she could figure that out in about one sentence. But listen, God wants you to prosper in the last third of your life too, even in your health. just as your soul prospers. Now listen, church, you can, this is what the word says, church. It says, what do you gain if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? You know what you gain? Hell. Listen, there's, there's two tickets off this earth. There's two tickets. And you get to choose which ticket you punch. You do. The word says this, you'll stand account for every word you say. You say, see, Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? They said, well, some say you're a prophet. Some say you're the Messiah. But then he got around where they live and said, who do you say I am? So when it gets down to where the rubber meets the road, that's what matters. Who do you say he is? You're either going to punch your ticket to hell or you're going to punch your ticket to heaven, church. And that doesn't sound very good. But listen, that's the truth. That's the truth. You're going to punch your ticket one of two places, and it's a one-way shot out of here. Thank God he gives us freedom to choose. He, he gives you, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't twist your arm and beat you with a boat paddle to get you to believe. That was just here. I didn't even bring that. Um, that was just here. Um, he, he doesn't do those things. He gives you the freedom to choose. What do you choose? Who do you say he is? So when it gets right down to the end, that's what matters. And here's at church, I'm not here to preach you gloom and doom. I'm not. But I want to tell you the truth. Today could be your last. Today could be your last. Every one of us got an expiration date. Here's the deal. You got to be ready. And this hurts, but I'm going to say it. Hell is full of people that someday God. One of these days. The word says this. This is the day of salvation. This is the day. Just as your soul prospers, abundant life. How do we have abundant life? I I have a couple rhetorical questions. Some of my favorite people to ask rhetorical questions are to my dad. My dad was here first service. He answered some of them audibly, um, which was funny. I will give him that. Um, God's called you to abundant life, right? Are you living it today? Are you living an abundant life today? I'm not saying full of stuff. I'm not saying so much stuff you can't take care of it. I'm not talking about that. Talk about abundant life. Would you even know if it was standing right in front of you? Do you feel good this morning? See, I don't hurt. I don't, and I'm thankful to God for that. Nothing hurts. I feel good, and I look good. No, I'm joking. (laughs) Uh, That was stupid. Anyway, are you living an abundant life today? Let me tell you something. I have determined in life to this point. Most things worth having in this life don't fall on your head like ripe cherries. You have to toil and struggle for them. Right? Right? They just don't fall on your head like ripe cherries. I've noticed things about life. People who are successful, listen, and I'm not, again, I'm not just talking about the financial aspect of it. I'm talking about everything. Somebody with a successful marriage invests time. It's work. It's more work for some than others. I'm sure it's more work for Audrey than it is me, right? Listen, you got to uh, you got to invest these things. You got to take time. You got to take time. Somebody with a successful ministry, they work at it. Their problems, your problems are their problems. If you ever just 
And it's fine. It's just how it is. If you ever meander your way to the front of the church, and I really have no idea how I got here. I don't. I have no idea. But here's what happens. Your problems are everyone's problems, and that's fine. Listen, we're, we're the family here. If my girls come home with a problem, I want them to tell me. The other day, Quincy, well, we heard it on Wednesday night that a, a boy tried hugging Quincy at school, and she didn't do anything. She didn't want to get in trouble. And I told her, I was like, you bust him in the mouth. Okay, I'll take care of the rest of that. She said, Dad, I want to get in trouble. I said, you're not going to get in trouble. I told her, I said a couple things. You're cute. And there's going to be boys going to try to hug you. And listen, you don't have to tell Quincy twice to punch somebody, okay? <laughs> she will bow it up in a second. And I, so the next morning, we're reviewing this. She's eating yogurt, and she's not a morning person. She's just, I mean, her heart's beating, but it's really slow. And she's eating yogurt. And, and she likes yogurt in the morning. She doesn't have to take the effort to chew. She can just swallow it. And, uh... <laughs> And I said, we call her Quinny, which makes her mad. Don't, don't call her that, or don't tell her I said that. We call her Quinny. I said, Quinny, what are you going to do if that boy tries to, tries to <laughs> hug you today? And she went, like, she just, just like this, she went, just jab the air. <laughs> uh, so anyway, it takes effort, church, to be successful at anything. Michael Jordan was the most talented basketball player ever, but he outworked everybody for a decade. He outworked everyone. Successful people get, and I don't care what it is, you get your rear end up out of bed and you go to work. Whatever that is. Listen, things in life worth having, relationship with your children, relationship with your friends, it takes effort. If you have a bunch of friends over to your house, it takes effort. They're going to want to eat. You're going to have to clean up after them. But I love a social event, especially when it's at somebody else's house. Um... <laughs> Amen. I heard an amen in the back. That's right. Somebody's with me. So how do we have abundant life? Uh, listen, John 10.10. 10. Everybody can quote John 10.10. 10. It says, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And listen, too many Christians today just focus on that. And then you leave it off. Listen, listen, this is what Jesus said. In this life, you're going to find turmoil, trouble. Things are going to happen. He said, but don't lose heart. Don't freak out. Don't be too dramatic. I've overcome the world. See, you're in this world, but you're not of this world. You've been bought and paid for with the price of Jesus, price, Jesus Christ's blood. You've been bought and paid for. Too many Christians today, Christians, want to focus. Oh, the thief comes. Oh, he comes. Yeah, he does. But the second half of that verse said, Jesus said, I came that you could have life and have it to the full. Are you living a full life today? And not, I'm just not talking about your schedule. Are you living a full life today? You know, a full life, an abundant life is available to all. And listen, your full life and your abundant life will look different than mine or the person in front of you. What happens a lot in life is we start saying, well, I want to play basketball like that guy. Well, that's not your gift. You know, Clayton, Clayton uh, Lyle used to say, you know, I, I wasn't ever cut out to be a basketball player. He said, I'm 5'6 and got a cross eye, okay? He's like, I can't even get it near the backboard. Basketball's not his thing. Right? Everybody's got their gift. Everybody's got their calling. If you're believing today that you have no gift, you're believing a lie. That's right. Your gift may be different than my gift, and thank the Lord. Abundant life. Abundant life is available to all. Mark chapter 5. Turn with me if you will. Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 2, says, When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. Yikes. Um, For he often been chained hand and foot, tore the chains apart, broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance... He ran, fell on his knees in front of him, and he said, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to me that you won't torture me. For Jesus said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? He said, My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again not to send them out, out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. When the, demon possessed, the demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd of about 2,000 in number rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. How do we live an abundant life? How do we live an abundant life? Number one thing, 
And it's in no order of importance. Somebody's got to be first. Number one thing is you got to get out of the tomb, church. You're alive. You're not dead. You're alive. You're not dead. You are a living, breathing person. And the word of God says it's a, there's a time to live and a time to die. And regardless of all the circumstances around you that are out of your control from Washington, D.C. to China, none of those things are in your control. God can prosper you through right now. This is your time. No one knows how long your time is. And some of you in the room here, and it was more apparent in first service, I think about this. Some of you have outlived people you never thought you would. Time is precious. Time is precious. I think about this all the time. My oldest daughter, if I as old as she, and it seems like just yesterday she was in diapers. She's eight years old, eight more years, and she's got a driver's license. Eight years goes by pretty quick. Seemed like it took me 50 years to get to my 16th birthday. And it seems like since then it's been two weeks. Is it just me or does time go quicker? See, you're alive. Can you imagine that, that spirit that's so evil? Have you guys ever been around a hog? I have very limited times, but you could take the most disgusting food you could imagine, put it in a trash bag, hang it from a tree for two weeks in August, and feed it to a hog, and it'll lap it up. Will it not? They'll eat one another if they have the opportunity. They're, I love to eat a hog, but there's probably nothing more disgusting than a Have you ever seen where a hog lives? There's a reason that we call our daughter's room a pigsty. There's a reason for that. They'll lay among the dead. And think about this. That spirit was so evil that a hog would rather die than have it. A hog. Didn't say he cast it out in a group of people. A hog. Some of you today need to realize you're alive and not dead and quit wallowing around in your last defeat. Stand up. Dust yourself off. And move on. Stand up. Get out of the tomb. You're not dead. Quit glorifying the pain, glorifying the hurt. Now listen, we're not going to sweep it under the rug. But listen, we need to glorify God and his goodness, not glorify the pain and the defeat. You need to learn from it, but you need to move on. Get out of the tomb. You're alive. Some of you look barely, but you're alive. <laughs> Second thing, Mark 5, just a couple, couple pages over. It says in verse 25, it says a large crowd, or a woman was uh, there who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up from behind, behind the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I could just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Now listen to me, church. There are Christians today, Christians, who have spent all they had trying to be healed. And listen, I'm not so much talking from here down. I'm talking from here up. There's too many Christians today losing the battlefield of the mind. There's a reason why Joyce Myers has sold however many million books that's entitled that, The Battlefield of the Mind. Pick a copy up and read it. Spent all you had, exhausted all your resources, spent an enormous amount of time, instead of getting better, you're just as bad as you were. Verse 29, immediately her bleeding stopped. She felt in her body that she was freed from her sufferings. Twelve years she bled. Twelve, twelve years. Now, I wouldn't want to have something happen to me where I was bleeding for 12 days. I think a lot of times in Scripture we brush over things because you've heard it so many times. 12 years. At once Jesus realized that the power had gone out from him. He turned around to the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you. His disciples answered, And yet you can ask, Who touched me? Have you ever been in a big crowd? I remember we went to see the first President Bush when I was a little kid in Marshfield, and I was, my mom was worried I'd get away from her, and she told me, hold on to my belt loops with both hands. And, you know, my mom's not very big, you know, and I'm back here trying to, because I, I would have got lost. And in all of that, Jesus knew when that power left him. Listen, he knows what's going on. 
good or bad, and beside uh, and above all that, he still loves you. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. When I was in the fourth grade, I broke this arm. Now listen, I'm going to tell you a story, shocking, and you, this is all true. I broke my arm in the old gym playing Polish kickball with Coach Compton. True story. If you walked in the old gym from the street side on the far end of the gym, there's doors there now, but it used to be these bricks, kind of a two-layered brick thing and a piece of plywood. And we were playing Polish kickball. And I've always been kind of competitive. Um, there's worse things, I guess. I don't know. My daughters are pretty competitive. My wife gets irritated with them. I said, listen, there's, there's two types of peoples in life, winners and losers, okay? <laughs> That's the truth now. And I said, if they want to be competitive, let them wool it out, right? And, and, that, and they're sore losers, then maybe they'll get over that a little bit. And they're really kind of sore winners. If one wins, you know, they're rubbing it in the other one's face. But let me tell you, I've always been competitive, and we were playing Polish kickball. And, and I was running back to home base, which you run the length of the gym. And, I, and Coach Compton caught the ball. And if you hit the person running with the ball, they're out. So he had the ball. And I'll never forget looking at him. He rolled that ball at me, and it got tangled up in my feet. And I was running pretty fast. And I was a little... I wore husky jeans probably then, and I fell against the wall. And I'll never forget looking down at my arm, and it had this thing, and it hurt. Now, they took me to Springfield. They set the arm. I had a cast on six or eight weeks, you know, like one of these up here to my shoulder. So fast forward, I go up and get it cut off, and I hadn't had my arm in a sling the whole time because I had this cast on, you know, like this. And I remember they, they cut that off of me, and I looked down at my arm, and it was like a pale number two pencil. And I was, and, and they put it in a sling, and I was just, oh, what am I going to do with this arm? You know, I have this misformed wing now, you know. And <laughs> so we go to the mall. I'm in the fourth grade, and my dad tells me, he's like, son, when we get back here, you're getting that arm out of that sling. And I thought, I don't think so. I'm never taking my arm out of this sling. <laughs> it's going to be in this sling forever. Just the, this looking at my arm made my stomach hurt. So we go to the mall, you know, whatever we did in there, and we come back out, and we're, and we're walking out of Sears. And Dad said, hey, come here. And, you know, I was a fourth grader. I was like, what? And I went over there, and he started wooling that sling off my head. And I was fighting him, you know, one-handed and all. And, and I got, I got, he got it off my arm, and I was just like, he's like, now straighten your elbow out. Uh-uh, uh-uh. He's like, you do it or I'm going to do it for you. And I had learned something about my father <laughs> at that point. He didn't mess around on deals like that. He, he would have done it. And I thought, well, I would rather do it than him. So I let my arm go, and I just like, ah. And I, I know I'm being pretty dramatic here, but fourth graders can be dramatic. Um, and, <laughs> and my arm got straight, and I just kind of walked around, you know, with this like this. And I got, we had a Dodge minivan, and I got in it, you know, just... And he's like, you're going to have to move your arm, son. He said, he kept telling me, you're healed. It's not broken anymore. It's not broken anymore. Now imagine, today, that's probably, I was, how old are you in the fourth grade? 10? Okay, I'm 37. Imagine 27 years later, I walk in with my arm in a sling this morning. Every one of you would have been, what happened? What happened, Scott? Oh, I broke my arm. Oh, when? In the fourth grade. <laughs> What's the matter with you? You're, how old are you? That would be the, how old are you? You've are you got two kids. How old are you now? I'd say, well, I broke it in the fourth grade. Listen to me. Some of you got offended 25 years ago. Some of you got hurt 25 years ago. Some of you fell and it hurt 10 years ago and you're still living crippled. When, when your faith has healed you. See, listen, this arm still works. I've done all kinds. I've lived with this arm. Imagine how, to, to, imagine how much I would have missed out on if my arm was still in a sling, even though it's healed. Listen, I have tackled quarterbacks. I've chased my kids. I've held my newborn babies. I've, I've settled my old shotgun on a gobbler's head. Many, I mean, I've done all kinds of things with this arm. I've made a living with this arm. 
I've waved at people. I've slapped my brother. I've done all kinds of stuff with this arm. This is the one I hang out the window of my truck when I'm driving. Listen, so many of you are missing out on what God has called you for, to an abundant life because you're crippled about something that happened a long time ago that God healed you. My arm's not broken anymore. Church, you're not broken anymore. You've been healed by your faith, as weak as it may be. But the Word says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed... That's what the word says. Is your, is your faith small? Guess what? That's better than no faith. It says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. Mustard seed ain't very big, church. Even if he said you had faith the size of a wheat seed. Well, that's not very big either, but it's a lot bigger. Quit living defeated. Quit living with your arm in a sling when it was set and fixed 25 years ago. Some of you today struggle with unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. And it's not so much maybe what somebody else did to you, but it's some, somewhere where you fell. And it was all on you. And you cannot forgive yourself. Listen. Listen. How can you forgive someone else if you can't forgive yourself? I'm going to ask for some audience participation. How many of you believe you're saved today by your profession of faith? Okay. Here, here's the deal, church. You're saved or you're unsaved, right? Listen, here's the deal. You're forgiven or you're not forgiven. Let me tell you something. People who are going to heaven are not going to heaven because they did more to be forgiven. They're going to heaven because God forgave them. And guess what? He forgave you and he forgave me. It doesn't matter whether the neighbor has forgiven me or not. Let me tell you what unforgiveness is. It's like me drinking poison and waiting for you to die. This hurts, but I'm going to, tell, I'm going to say it anyway. I don't, that doesn't seem to bother me. Um, you living in unforgiveness and bitterness about something that happened to you or something you did diminishes the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. It cuts it down. It diminishes it. Because what you're saying with your actions is that the, what he did can't cover what I did, but it can. It can. Who the Son set free is free indeed. You don't need to forgive somebody for them. You need to forgive them for you. And also, whoever this person may be, myself, you need to forgive yourself. Guess what? Breaking news, you're not perfect. What would happen in life if everybody who made a mistake quit doing anything for God? We'd all be on a ship going to hell. Right? Stand up, out of the tomb, dust yourself off, and start living. Nobody said, Jesus Christ himself, that living an abundant life for him would be easy. We just discussed most things in life worth having don't come easy. Right? Back to my newly printed page here. Live forgiven, church. 27 years later, my arm doesn't hurt. 20, 27, how foolish would it be for me to have my arm in a sling right now? How foolish. Your faith has healed you. And he said this to, that, to the woman with the issue of blood. And you, you, you name yours. You name yours. What he's telling you to do is go live in peace and stop the bleeding. <laughs> stop being, stop suffering. I, Jesus died so you could be free. And the third thing, which is actually four things, um, so to live abundant, we need to get out of the tomb, realize you're alive, you're not dead. Your faith is healed. You go in peace and be freed from suffering. Third thing is we need to press on Endure 
fight back, and win. Now listen to me. Pressing on. Philippians 3, verse 12. Paul is writing here. It says, not that I've already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to yet taken hold of it. He reminds it again. He hasn't arrived. Neither have I, neither have you, right? My dad always used to say, you don't want to get too big for your britches. I don't really know what that means. Anyway, moving right along. Uh, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what's ahead. It doesn't say strolling. A Sunday afternoon drive says straining. Listen, if you're going to live abundantly for Christ, if you're going to live abundantly, it's going to take effort on your part. Effort. Persistence. Another word for pressing on is persistence. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. Paul faced setback after setback after setback. Noah built an ark in a land where it hadn't rained for 20 year, or 120 years. Or excuse me. Noah worked on an ark for 120 years in a land where it had never rained. It had never... Has, have any of you in here, if Grover is here, I'd make an old joke, but have any of you ever worked on anything for 120 years? Do you think there were days that that all went smoothly? He didn't have a DeWalt. He didn't have a Husqvarna. He didn't have a front-end loader. Exactly. 120 years. Do you not think he was a laughing stock of the community? You know what the Word says? The things of the Spirit are foolish to them that don't believe. It's foolish. Why can't some quacked-out politician get it? Because they don't know the Spirit of God. That's why. It's not rocket science. Things of God are foolish to them because they don't know God. Guess where people who don't know God are going, church? Straight to the pits of hell. That's why you're here. That's why you need to live abundantly because you rub off on the people around you. I, I press on. Go to with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second half of verse 22. Paul says this. Or second half of verse 23. He says, I am more. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently. And listen, all this list of stuff he's going to tell you are real life events that happened to a man. And this is why they happened to the man. Because he was spreading the good news of Christ. Listen to me. Don't be naive to the fact to think that if you're going to live abundantly, that the opposition is not going to fight you tooth and nail. That's why one of the things and the last thing is to fight back. We're going to get to that. You are the New Testament church. What does that mean? That means that his days are numbered. Satan's days are numbered. And desperate people take desperate measures. He doesn't want you to live abundantly. Don't be surprised if you're attacked. because But the Word of God says this. Listen, in, in, in Matthew twenty two twenty nine, 29, I believe Jesus says this. You are in error. Me, myself included, are in error because you don't know the Scriptures. You need to be speaking Scriptures over your situation, over your life, over your circumstances, even if nobody hears you. Because if the Word says you're justified by your words and you're also condemned by them, what are you speaking to fruition in your life? He says, I am more, I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times from the Jews, I've received 40 lashes minus one. Is that what it said? Five times. Five times, 39 licks. My dad gave a memorable correction when I was a kid, but I never got 39 licks. In one setting. I'm sure I got way more than that over time. But anyway, listen. Have any of you ever taken 39 licks for your faith? And even though this, listen. They could beat him 
and beat him and beat him, but they can't get one ounce of faith out of Paul. Five times I've received from the Jews, 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. What? Uh, listen, one shipwreck for me and I ain't getting on another ship. I'll fly, okay? He didn't have that option. Three times he was shipwrecked. I spent the night and day in the open sea. I've turned a, a canoe over in the North Fork River. I've never been shipwrecked. I've never spent an overnight or a whole day lost at sea, church. And what for? To spread the gospel, to tell people about good news there is in Jesus Christ. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in, dangers from, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else I face, listen, over all of those five lashes, three beatings with rods, three shipwrecks, above all that stuff, setbacks, difficulties, straining, all of that stuff, he said, beside everything else I face, the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. I would be throwing a pity party of monumental proportions if I had been through a tenth of that. His main concern wasn't about him. My mom used to always say, and she still does it, and it's no offense if you've never had children, but she said a lot of times, sometimes, um, that... You think the world revolves around you until you have kids, right? And then you realize it's not about you, it's about them, right? Listen, Paul realizes it's not about him. He's a part of the body. But been through all of that, and he said, my main concern is for all the churches. Skip over to verse 12, or excuse me, chapter 12, verse 7. To keep me from being conceited, because these great and surpassing great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, and listen, this is the Spirit of God speaking to you today as well. It says, my grace is sufficient for you. God's grace has got you covered. There's nothing you will or ever have done that God's grace will not cover. And if you're believing in, you're hearing a voice in your mind that says his grace won't cover that, that's a lie from hell, church. For your power is made perfect in weakness. He said, therefore, I boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and insults and hardships and persecution and difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Listen, we got we, we, we to press on. We got to press on. Successful people press on. Even though it may be a short gain today, we gain something we gain something. The word says you won't grow weary in doing good. You won't grow weary in doing good. David lived in caves. King David, before he was a king, lived in caves to elude a king who wanted to kill him because David saved Israel by killing a giant. That was tough. I've never lived in a cave. I visited caves, and I'm claustrophobic, and I'm glad when I'm out of the cave. Okay? Fantastic caverns is not so fantastic to me, especially when they turn the lights off. I want to puke, okay? I can't stand that. I'm like, turn the lights back on. Um, but I did have a good time at Fantastic Caverns. My daughters, my dad used to embarrass me when I, we would be in public, so I embarrassed my daughters, and, and they would, we would be meeting another Jeep load of people, and I'd go, don't go, don't go. And they'd look at me like, what? I'm like, it's terrible. Anyway, the girl, girl thought it was funny. Um, so if that was you, I apologize, but I'm not really sorry. Um, <laughs> persistence, church. That's how Noah got the ark built, was persistence. Um, when I was 16, um, I've always liked cows, and I'm not really sure why. And uh, I've always been interested in agriculture. And <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a story 
and it's not to paint me in any kind of light. Uh, I've not arrived, like Paul said, not that I've already obtained this. I, I've not reached any, some kind of high pinnacle in the cattle business or anything like that. I'm just going to tell you this story. Um, I was 16, and I had a few bottle calves that I had raised, and I wanted to buy some cows. And I wanted some bread cows, but I was on a limited budget. And in fact, limited, I didn't have any money. And, uh, and they, they don't, yes, it was limited, John. Thank you for your support. Um, so I went down, I had some calves at my grandma Lois's house. My, that's my dad's mom. And I, I, she was out in the yard one day and I, and she said, I told her I wanted to buy some cows, but I wasn't sure how all that was going to work out. And I had this thought of mine, I asked grandma and I said, Hey grandma, would you loan me some money to buy some cows. And before I could even tell her how much or how many or whatever, she said, no, no. And it just, and, and I really wasn't that surprised. It wasn't her deal. I mean, she'd raised, it wasn't her deal to take care of me, right? I was like, well, okay, plan B. But before I could even say something else, she said, no, but I'll give you some. But I'll give you some. She said, how much do you need? And I said, $800. And she said, how many cows can you buy with $800? And I said, I hope three. And she said, well, they won't be very good cows. <laughs> and she was right. So she had this, I have a shelf in the, we've, in, I've got an office in the basement. And that shelf, that bookshelf is in my office. And it used to be in my grandma Lois's house. And there was a book in the bottom shelf, a blue one, that she had some money in. And she pulled that book out and she counted me out. $800. And when she died, my, I thought my mom and dad knew about that book. And my brother and I could have had a party, but I told mom and dad, like, hey, there's some money in that book. Now, I don't know how much there was, but there was probably enough to, to buy 800 There was at least $800 in there because that's what she gave me. So I called John Belts. A lot of you know John Belts. And I said, John, and here, here's the thing. Uh... I don't know how many at the time, thousand head of cattle John Belts had. But John Belts wanted to help. And I called him and said, John, I want to buy some cows. He said, well, how much money do you have? I said, $800. And he said, well, I'll try. He said, what do you want? I said, something that's alive and bred. <laughs> and he said, okay. So a few weeks, a couple weeks went by, and he, he called and left a message at my, of course, we didn't have cell phones, and all the kids said, what? And we didn't have, and called and left a, a message at my parents' house that said, hey, I've got Scott three cows down at West Plains. Oh, man, I'm in. So I went over to Teddy Taylor's house and borrowed his stock trailer that had more metal missing than it was there, didn't it, Floyd? It was rusty, to say the least, and I drove to West Plains, and I went in there, and I paid for them, and they were $775. And I paid cash for them. Ah, folded out my grandma's money. And I'll never forget this. I drove around the same place you load now. And listen, church stuff is stuff, right? Stuff is just stuff. My Uncle Clint uh, and my Aunt, my Aunt Goldie just passed away a couple weeks ago. And a week ago Saturday, my family and I, my, my girls and Audrey and I went out and went in their house. And it looks just like it did when I was growing up. But see, they're not there. And they were the ones that made it special. Not the stuff. Because guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to cash your check one of these days and somebody's going to dig through your stuff. That's all it is. So I backed up there, and I'll never forget there was a guy. I like trucks, big trucks, new trucks, old trucks. I like all trucks. I, and there was a guy, it's right when a Duramax diesel came out, like the first one. And this guy was backed up there in the first hole. And I remember seeing those cows. I went in the sale barn for a little bit. And these beautiful red cows, great, big, slick, beautiful cows. And this guy had bought them. And he was probably like in his mid-50s. And he, they were loading them. And they had these two big, long trailers backed up there. And these cool diesel pickups. And I was in awe of that just because I think I, I'm impressed. But I like stuff like that. I like cattle trailers. Okay, sue me. And uh, so anyway, I'll never forget, I went and handed this guy my ticket. 
And he looked at my ticket and he rode off, you know, on a horse. And and they were running these beautiful big red cows, one right after the other, into this guy's trailer. And then here come my little ghosts around the corner. Talk about the Holy Ghost. Now they were little bitty guys. And I and, and I'll never forget this. This guy that I don't know if he'd bought the cows or he was just the one hauling the cows, it didn't matter. But he was loading those big, nice cows. And listen, a cow is just a cow. And they were running them in there. And he looked over at me in this rust bucket trailer with three cows that, to tell you how small they are, they all fit in the front half of a 14-foot little, little narrow stock trailer. You know, they're little bitty guys. I ran him, and I'll never forget, he, was, he had a hot shot, and he was back there behind those cows. And he looked at me, and he kind of smiled, and he looked back, and he said, just hang in there. Just hang in there. Church, quitting at any time in your Christian walk is too soon. Quitting. Some of you this morning are on the verge of quitting something because it's gotten tough. You're on the verge of quitting on a relationship, quitting on a job, quitting on a circumstance that you know God brought before you because it's tough. Quitting any time. In your Christian walk is too soon. You know when you can quit on it, when you're in heaven with him, the work's done. So I brought those cows home, all 419 pounds a piece. I don't know what, they were little bitty. And it seems like I went through the most of my high school career before they had a calf big enough to sell. And I took them to Mountain Grove and the calves brought $400 a piece. They brought more than the cows did. And I was just like, man, I can, I can retire right now, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and after that, I called John, and I wanted some more cows with that money. And he, he said, okay. So he, this time he hauled them out north of town. And I, I went out there, and here's a guy who didn't have to help. He didn't have to, but he chose to. He hauled those cows out there, and he told me this when I went out there, and they looked about the same, you know, little Casper 1, 2, and 3. And uh, he said, now, I'm going to give you an offer I don't give a lot of people on cattle. I said, okay, what is it? He said, I'll give you a money-back guarantee on these. I said, what do you mean? He said, just bring them back dead or alive. He said, I'll give you your money back. And I said, what, what do you mean? He, he said, I'm only going to say it one more time. He said, these cattle have a money-back guarantee. And I said, why? He said, because I want to help you. Why do you need to press on? Why do you need to press on? Why do you not need to quit? Because there's somebody coming behind you that God is going to put in your path that you can help. And not just help with a $100 bill, but help with an encouraging word. Somebody that, that calls you and says, I need advice on this situation quitting any time church is too soon Jesus was insulted spit upon beaten stabbed beaten again forced to carry his cross which in fact was my cross Cursed, stripped naked. Can you imagine, church, how embarrassing it would be, how humiliating it would be to go before a big group of people and be stripped naked? Whipped with a cat of nine tails. Falsely accused. Feet and hands pierced for you and me. Died a, criminal's cross, died a criminal's death on the cross so you can live free. And through all of that, nobody... Listen, he was the son of God, but he was flesh and blood. It hurt. It was tough. It was tough. And here's the thing about him. He knew the whole thing was coming. He even said before that, he said, God, if there's any other... Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But if not... This is what he said. He said, your will be done and not mine. He didn't quit when it got tough. And because of that, 
we have salvation today. Because of that, we have salvation today. Because of that, you can be free. Because of that, you can live. Because of that, you can have abundant life today. But the first step to abundant life is getting up off the ground. Press on. What is your goal? Your goal should be to get to heaven and take as many people with you as you can. And most of the people you're going to reach, I believe, isn't with the words you say. It's going to be with how you live your life. Church, we need to fight back. The Word of God says, when the day of evil comes, that's not to live in fear. Listen, do you think King David, when he was walking to see his brothers, to meet Goliath, don't you think he was stirred up in his spirit? Don't you think he's like, something's going to go down here? I, I, I don't, that's not scriptural, that's just my interpretation. I think he, something's going to, and when he saw that giant, I think, oh, there he is. That's why I'm here. Don't be overwhelmed or frightened. Be ready. Ephesians 6 says, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you can stand your ground. And when you've done everything you can to do, what do you do? Stand. Stand and fight and claw and whatever you've got to, like Quinny, you know, start jabbing, whatever you got to do. Because listen, there are a few things in life that come up that you have a few options. You can lay down and die or you can stand up and fight. And see, you're free to choose. We got to fight back, church. You are in a spiritual battle Now, the opposition doesn't want you to live abundantly, but the Word of God says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. What does that mean? I heard that my whole life. That means the Spirit of God, if you're a born-again believer, is greater in you than Satan who's in the world. You have authority over that. You have authority over him. Don't let him steal your joy that's a gift of God, your peace that's a gift from God, your strength which is a gift from God, your wisdom which is a gift from God. Don't let him take something that's not yours. How many times? Listen, when I was growing up, my brother was four years older than me. Had I been able to whip him when I was 12, I would have given him a good one, okay? Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? I took a bunch of them. Had I been old enough, now as we got older, the the playing field got more level. You know what I'm saying? I punched him one time going to Alabama to deer hunt, and he had a big mark on his face. And my dad was like, what are we going to tell Leroy and Edna? I was like, you're going to tell him I jacked him in the face. That's what happened, right? (laughs) Listen, how many times are you going to let an inferior somebody slap you around? How many, how many times, dads, are you going to let somebody at your kid's birthday party come up and act a fool and slap your kids around and insult your wife? How many times are you going to let that happen? I'm going to tell you it's only going to happen once for me. Either I'll be dead or handcuffed the only way it'll happen again. And I, I mean that. I'm here. One of my deals in life is when I go somewhere, I am ready to defend my family at a moment's notice. I will slap somebody into next week. But yet, you'll let Satan ease right into your home and take everything that's not his. Fight back. Endure. Persist. Move forward. Press on. Peace does not belong to him. It belongs to you. Your salvation doesn't belong to him. It belongs to you. Wisdom doesn't belong to him. It belongs to you. What God has given you, no one else can take unless you give him the authority to take it. Go get your stuff back. See, that's stuff that goes beyond you. That's stuff that goes beyond your your time. Fight back. And the last thing is win. I told you that my girls are a little bit competitive. And there are winners and losers in life, church. Is it not true? There's winners and losers. They're playing the Baseball World Series right now, and only one will get a trophy, and it's the ones that win. See, we have an obligation, church, and it's not 
my mind's made up. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to win this race. Okay, what does that mean? I, I'm not airing up my own head. I'm just telling you, I've made my mind up. I, I'm with Jesus Christ, dead or alive. Uh, I, I've made my mind up. See, but why is it so important that we win? Because, see, I've got ones coming behind me. And for them to live abundantly, as Jesus Christ has called them, they need to know what that looks like. They need to know what that acts like. They need to know how that looks and how that acts and how that responds when it's tough. When it's tough. Do I cower down and bawl and wallow in my own mess? Do I get up and dust myself on, dust myself off and press on? Circumstances come, church, and circumstances go. But you are living your legacy for the ones you leave behind right now. I want, them, I want my daughters to know you just got to keep on keeping on. You got to keep plugging forward. Even though the plowing may be tough today, maybe tomorrow it'll be easier. Maybe not. But you only have one choice, and that's to keep on moving. I want to win. Now think about this. I believe this with my whole heart. The difference between failure and victory is in your own effort. Church, it takes no talent. It takes no skill set. It takes no good looks or being able to wax eloquent. That's not your car that's speaking, right? It takes none of those things to give an effort. Right? It doesn't take... It takes no skill. You can't be able to sing a three-piece harmony or any of that to, to, to give an effort. So the difference between winning and losing is in your own effort. Here's why. It's not your fight. It's God's. It's not your fight. It's God's. Can you imagine a college football team Somebody standing before them in August and saying, you will win the national championship if you just give your best effort in every game. you win. Any team would take that. Any team, even Arkansas. <laughs> no, that's a joke of you. Uh, anybody would take that, right? And you've been given that guarantee. All you got to do is try. Philippians 1.6 in the, in the New Living says, God who began the good work within you. God who began. How many ever believe God's done something good in your life? We're almost done. Raise your hand if you believe God has done anything good. Okay. God who began, God who began doing a good work in your life will keep on helping you grow in his grace. What does that mean? When you mess up, he doesn't forget about you. Helping you grow in his grace until the work is com and I'm paraphrasing, though the work within you is completed when Jesus Christ returns. Stand to your feet. Father God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are. God, we thank you, Lord, for what you do. Um, Aaron, if you want to, I don't know if Aaron, yeah, I see Aaron. Um, God, we thank you, God, for what you're doing. Father God, we thank you for who you are, Lord. We thank you that, uh, that God, you take care of things, Father God. Lord, even when we're even when we're not, Lord, your word says, Father God, you're working for the good of those who love us, Father God, and you or love you, Lord, and you don't give up on us, Lord, Lord, and we don't want to give up on you. God, we thank you for who you are, Lord, and, and we thank you, God, that, uh, that we can win today, Lord, in Jesus' name. We can win today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Just real quickly, church, I'm not going to wear this out. Um, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I, I believe in my heart that acknowledging something before God is the first step to winning, winning a battle. And uh, I believe that somebody in here today feels like every morning you get up, you're just looking for the next place to fall. You're looking for the next, you're looking for the next place to lose. If you feel like you just keep losing and losing, and losing. God's called you to be a winner. He's called you to be victor, to be victorious. We sang about it today. Can you see a victory? If that's you today, 
just acknowledge, raise your hand. No one's, no one's going to call your name out. No one's going to do anything. We just acknowledge that before God. Amen. God's called you to be a winner. He's called you to the victory. One more. The plowing is tough. Life is just tough, whether it's circumstances, whether it's financial, whether it's relational, whether it's a schedule that's busy, whether it's a struggle of some kind. It's just tough. It's just tough. And you need encouragement today. Just acknowledge that before God. The Word of God says that He is our eternal encouragement. He encourages you forever. In church, encouragement is like bathing. You need it daily. And this is the last thing. Then we're going to pray and we're done. You're tired of getting whipped. You're tired of having your peace, your joy, even your forgiveness taken from you. You're tired of living in regret or living in doubt, living in pain, living in hurt of decisions either someone else made or decisions you've made that were wrong. You're tired of getting whipped. And you want, you want the encouragement and the strength to fight back. If that's you, just acknowledge that before God. Amen. God has called you to be more than a conqueror. Romans 8, 37 you're more, more, says you're more than conquerors through Christ. Isaiah 54, 17 says no weapon formed against you will prevail. No weapon. So we're going to pray. If you want somebody to pray for you, you come forward now and we'll, we'll pray with you. And uh, listen, everybody look up here. We're going to pray. Today can be different. How do you complete a long journey, church? You got to take the first step. You got to take the first step. If you want prayer, you come forward. Uh, some of you ladies would come come pray. Uh, God, we just thank you, Lord, for who you are. Father God, you th I thank you, Lord Jesus, that, uh, Lord, you, that, that John 10, 10 doesn't stop with a thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, Father God, but it goes on to say that I can have, that we can have life and have it to the full, Lord. I just pray, God, that that uh, we just silence the voice of the opposition right now, Lord, and, and uh, Lord, we rebuke him out of the door. Lord, your word says at the sound of your name, the enemy will flee, Lord. It says to put on the full armor of God so we can resist when that day comes, Lord. Lord, we can have a helmet of salvation, a breastplate prayed of righteousness, Lord, the belt of truth, Lord, and the shoes fitted ready to spread the gospel, Lord. We can have our sword, Lord, the sword of the Spirit, Father God, that's alive and active to the dividing of spirits, Lord. Lord, be with the people that need to fight back, that need to stand up and fight back. Even if it's a little jab like Quinny gave with her yogurt, Lord. If it's just a jab to get started, Lord, a step in the right direction, Lord, is the step we need. Lord, your word says the footsteps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord, Father God. And there's somebody out here today that doesn't know what step to take, Lord. Your word also says we have not because we ask not, Lord. I just pray you'll give them courage to ask. And then when that direction and that course is laid out before them, that they can press on day after day, be persistent in their faith and persistent in our walk, Lord. Lord, I pray for diligence, Lord just to keep on, just keep plugging along, keep moving forward, keep straining forward to the prize that's ahead. Lord, and I pray today that the people that feel like they keep losing, Lord, that they can start winning in Jesus' name, Father God. You have, Lord, all of us have lost a battle before, Lord, but today we're going to win a war. We're going to win the war. Lord, we thank you, God. We love you, Lord. I pray, God, that we can get out of the tomb and live, Father God, that we can live healed, Lord, and live forgiven, Lord, and we can press on, we can endure, Lord, we can fight back, and we can win today and tomorrow, Lord, and the next day if you don't come, Lord, in Jesus' name, Lord. In Jesus' name, Lord. God, there's power in your name. 
Lord, help us to tap into that power today, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, church. Live abundantly.